welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Costantino Grasso. I'm an associate professor in business and law at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I am honored to welcome you today uh, to this international roundtable in my capacity as the principal investigator of Whistling at the Fake, the crucial role of whistleblowers in countering disinformation, which is a research project funded by the NATO Public Diplomacy Division as part of its resilience projects. And that aims at addressing the gap of citizen comprehension of the forms, means, and impacts of mal, mis, and disinformation, as well as the, at empowering the public with the tools through which to identify fake news, including appropriate responses to such behaviors. Furthermore, the project focuses on the crucial role that whistleblowers and other knowledgeable insiders play in exposing misleading and hostile information activities and increasing public resilience to acts of this nature. It's not easy uh, for me to offer your, uh, you today uh, opening remarks. Mm, I'd imagine this to be a joyful occasion where we would have been able to gather and discuss so many important issues together. However, uh, the very sad news we have been hearing since yesterday from Ukraine has thrown us into the grim reality of war we cannot ignore. Echoing the words of the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, we cannot tolerate military actions aimed at replacing the rule of law with the rule of force. It was 1914, immediately after the attack on Belgium, the German chancellor called the treaty guaranteeing Belgium's neutrality a scrap of paper. We would have thought that after more than 100 years and two world wars, arbitrary exercise of violence would have been finally subordinated to well-defined, established and just laws. However, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have learned that the hard way that peace, freedom, and justice cannot be taken for granted. Our thoughts go out to all those affected by this terrible tragedy, and in particular to all the Ukrainian families that are currently losing loved ones and are suffering. This tragic event should reinforce our determination to do better today understanding the phenomenon of mal, mis, and disinformation and how to respond to them should currently be one of my, our main priorities. This not only because the attack on Ukraine has demonstrated how information warfare has been used by the Russian regime to try to justify the use of violence against an independent country. False narratives have been spread by Russian media, including an accusation against Ukrainians of genocide in Donbass, and there is a need for denazification of Ukraine. But also because mal, mis, and disinformation represent a serious domestic threat for democracies themselves. Over the course of the latest decades, a generalized malaise has affected democracies and has not spared countries with well-established democratic traditions. United States, Japan, and several European countries have simultaneously experienced a discrepancy between the growing demand for good governance and its dwindling supply, which has led to political breakdowns. In particular, one of the most alarming threats faced by our democratic society has been the veil of ignorance generated through mal, mis, and disinformation, as well as limiting access to or filtering relevant information. Such techniques have sometimes been, been used to cover the distorted ways in which institutions may operate and have altered the citizens' per perception of the reality, adversely affecting how our societies hold on to the fundamental values of justice, fairness, and equality. It is evident that the negative behaviors that affect our societies need a shroud of secrecy to thrive. Special interests may effectively block people from receiving fair representation and responsive, accountable governance, only where corrupt deals and other forms of conflicts of interest do not emerge with sufficiently clarity and, as a result, do not attract attention of watchdogs and other members of the civil society. The slogan adopted in 2017 by the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness, perfectly convey such ideas. Within such a grim scenario, the role of whistleblowers, leakers, and other knowledgeable insiders has demonstrated to be crucial to assist us in unveiling fake news or incorrect pieces of information. 
or in disseminating truth that otherwise would have been deliberately shrouded in secrecy. Our research project is driven by the ambition to cast light on these burning issues and the today's International Roundtable, which is focused on malmis and disinformation in the public sector, is dedicated to such a purpose. Please allow me now to thank most sincerely our esteemed and internationally renowned partners that are cooperating with Manchester Metropolitan University and actively contributing to the success of this project, including the law schools of the Boston College, the University of Padova, and Tilburg University, as well as the law firm Constantin Cannon, the Center for the Study of Democracy, and the Government Accountability Project. I would also like to give a special thank you to Professor Diane Ring, who is Interim Dean and Professor of Law at Boston College Law School. She will moderate what promises to be a constructive, fascinating afternoon of discussion. The project has greatly benefited from her valuable contribution, and we are grateful for her continued and considerable support. A special thank you also to Mary Im, partner at Costanding Cannon, and Samantha Feinstein, staff attorney and direct director of the international program at the Government Accountability Project, who have co-organized this event and actively contributed to the success of our initiative. Thank you also to Stephen Holden, a doctoral student at Manchester Law School and senior research assistant at the Whistling at the Fake. Finally, a big thank you to our terrific panelists, and all the members of the audience that have taken the time to be with us today. I hope you will enjoy the discussion and take the chance to interact with our amazing experts asking questions through the Zoom question and answer interface. I'm now delighted to give the floor to Professor Diane Ring. Dear Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Costa. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, I just want to take a moment to explain the basics for our uh, roundtable today. We are trying to cover the topics um, that Costa outlined in three separate sessions, um, and we'll have a five minute break between each of the sessions. Um, and just to reiterate, um, we encourage you, um, the audience, to put your thoughts and questions into the Q&A. Um, we're very eager for your participation. Um, if your question seems to relate to something we're about to come to, we might hold it for a little bit, um, but we encourage you to dive right in and do so. All right, I'd like to first start by introducing uh, our panelists, whom we are delighted to have with us. Um, we have uh, three panelists who are whistleblowers, and each one of them is going to lead off each of our three sessions. Um, our three whistleblowers are first, Grant Turner, uh, Chief Financial Officer of the United States Agency for Global Media, uh, and he's also a whistleblower. Uh, Grant Turner, um, uh, his work with uh, the U.S. Agency for Global Media, it funds Voice of America and other government-funded public service media outlets, uh, and he is a nonpartisan employee of the United States Civil Service. Our second whistleblower, Robert McLean, he's a former US Air Marshal and a whistleblower. Um, he went public regarding Al Qaeda plot to uh, against, I guess, to again breach routinely unlocked flight decks. Uh, the pilots unions have publicly protested government failure to install secondary barriers in the front of newly armed cockpits, similar to what other countries had done. After Robert's disclosures, the 9-11 Commission's report uh, demonstrated hijackers waited for pilots to open cockpit doors uh, to then gain entry. Our third panelist, uh, um, who's a whistleblower, is Kevin Shemolinsky. Uh, and Kevin served as Deputy Chief of Staff at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under the Trump administration. He helped expose many of former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt's ethical scandals including potential illicit deletion of items from Pruitt's public calendar and his chronic abuse of taxpayer dollars. Kevin took his grievances public, backed them up with solid evidence and gave several media interviews. He provided critical testimony to congressional oversight committee members and set off a chain reaction that resulted in Pruitt's forced resignation in July, 2018. Then I'd like to turn to our other panelists. And I just wanted to make a mention, my uh, bio introductions are brief to give us time to get right into the panel. I encourage all of you to look at the Whistling at the Fake website um, to see a little bit more detail about each of our panelists. Okay, also joining us today, Maurizio Bianchini. Uh, he's an associate professor of business law at the School of the University of Padova 
where he teaches competition law, IP law, and comparative corporate and business law. We also have joining us Rowan Damon. Uh, Rowan is Director General of ARIJ, Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. She has 20 years of experience in academic and professional media management, television, and digital training. And she's worked on producing and directing more than 30 hours of documentaries and investigative stories, including the award-winning Al Nakaba series. We have Jesse Isinger, an American journalist and author who currently works as a senior reporter for ProPublica. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2011 and published his first book, The Chicken Chick Club, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives in 2017. In 2021, he authored the investigative report, The Secret IRS Files, Trove of Never Seen Before Records Reveal How the Wealthiest Avoid the Income Tax. We have Samantha Feinstein. Samantha is a staff attorney and director of the international program at the Government Accountability Project. She develops and advances private sector whistleblower rights legislation, represents public, private, and international whistleblower clients, and conducts research, training, advocacy, and public education for the international program. We have Goran Georgiev. Uh, he's an analyst at CSD's economic and securities programs. He focuses on studying the impact of the Kremlin's disinformation narratives on public perceptions and policymaking in Bulgaria and the wider Central and European, Euro, Euro, Eastern European region. He serves as a disinformation expert in several initiatives aimed at countering Russia's disinformation operations, including the International Republic Institute's Beacon Project. Uh, Safa Naim, uh, who joins us, is an associate program director at Tactical Tech and project leader of the Data Detox Kit, Digital Inquirer Kit, and Digital U projects, focusing on creating accessible and engaging resources for adults that explore data privacy, digital literacy, research, and verification. Also joining Mary Inman, partner in Constantine Cannon's London office. Um, after 20 plus years representing whistleblowers in the US, she moved to London 2017 to launch the practice uh, there. She specializes in representing whistleblowers worldwide under American reward programs. And her efforts on behalf of British whistleblower Andrew Patrick were featured uh, in a fairly recent New York Times article. Mary McGuire, also joining us, serves as senior lecturer and law at MMU uh, Manchester. Uh, University, Costa, leading uh, in IP and media law. And she has a particular interest in freedom of expression, integrity in journalism, and protection of journalist sources, along with a strong interest in sources of news and verification of information accessed by and targeted at young people. Uh, Lord Premsika was set to join us today, but he had an unavoidable conflict uh, and does send his regrets. And finally, Donato Voza. Uh, is a lecturer in criminal law at the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Roehampton in London. Previously, he served as a research associate in financial crime at the Center for Financial and Corporate Integrity at Coventry University. His areas of expertise include corporate crime, business integrity, human rights, as well as international, transnational, and European criminal law. Uh, so you can see why we're delighted to have our panelists with us today. I think they're going to provide a uh, really far ranging perspective on the really important topics we have um, before us today. As I mentioned, each session is going to start off with one of our three whistleblowers presenting their case. And so for our first session, this first session is disinformation and democracy, uh, the political level. Um, we, I'd like to welcome Grant Turner um, to lead us off. Thank you, Grant. Thanks, Diane. Uh, thanks, Costin. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone stateside, and good afternoon to those of you in Europe and beyond. Uh, I'd like to thank our hosts for assembling a, a really wonderful discussion today. I appreciate that many of you uh, on the panel and you know, who are attending today think, uh, think deeply about whistleblower issues, uh, their role in driving accountability, and the circumstances throughout the world that make whistleblowers indispensable, in my opinion. Uh, I don't have many answers myself, but I did live through a very uh, remarkable uh, whistleblower situation at the U.S. Agency for Global Media and Voice of America. So I'm, I'm honored to have the chance to, to tell you my story and participate in, in today's discussion. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I'm, I'm here independently today. 
uh, uh, my agency has asked that I say specifically that I'm not representing the agency at this forum. I'm just speaking for myself. Um, as many a whistleblower can attest, that's a familiar feeling. You're often just on your own without a, a, lot, of, a lot of cover. Um, I never expected to be a whistleblower, but I found myself in that situation during the uh, last year of the Trump administration, uh, when the United States Senate finally confirmed Donald Trump's controversial nominee to head my agency. Uh, that person was a man named Michael Pack, uh, who, uh, according to the Washington Post, was recommended for the job by none other than Steve Bannon, uh, to give you kind of a sense of the company he keeps. Um, at the time, I was serving as the chief financial officer for uh, the U.S. Agency for, uh, for Global Media, and immediately before the Trump appointee arrived, I was serving as the interim CEO. Uh, my agency is one of the largest news organizations in the world, and you might be familiar with some of the networks, uh, including Voice of America, <clears throat> uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, uh, the Middle East Broadcasting Network, Al Hura. Uh, these are some of our, our properties. Uh, each week, we reach approximately 400 million people around the world. Uh, by law, our networks aren't allowed to broadcast in the United States, so we don't do any domestic broadcasting. The audiences we reach are typically in countries with immature media markets or where the government itself doesn't uh, permit or want a free press to operate. Uh, with over 800 million in annual funding, we aim to provide accurate news and information and to help break the cycle of misinformation uh, disinformation and propaganda that exists in, in many markets worldwide. Uh, so it, it was a deeply disturbing irony that, that our networks were targeted for takeover by people who I believe ultimately wanted to turn the agency into a cheerleader for President Trump and his policies, uh, something very far from uh, just you know, uh, professional journalism. Uh, National Public Radio, or NPR, as most uh, people in America call it, uh, it's a large domestic news organization in the U.S. Uh, they began covering the story of how my agency was being politicized, uh, and, and I wanted to read a, a few tidbits from an article published by uh, David Falkenflick uh, to give just a little bit of uh, context. Uh, NPR said, Trump's choice to leave the U.S. Agency for Global Media uh, had assured senators, considering his confirmation, that he believed in the importance of the independent news coverage provided by Voice of America and its sister networks. Instead, Michael Pack's seven-month tenure offered a near-perfect encapsulation of Trumpism. Once confirmed by the Senate, Pack announced his charge was to drain the swamp, to root out corruption, and to deal with these issues of anti-Trump bias. Pack obsessed over staff loyalty, embraced conspiracy theories, and refused to allow visa extensions for his foreign journalists. In short, he proceeded to wage ideological warfare on his own agency. Uh, it's a little, a little bit of, um, I think, uh, table setting for, um, for I think this this guy's approach to the agency. Um, uh, let me add to that NPR excerpt a quick list of of some of what this person and his handpicked team achieved during their short tenure. Um, much of this list also encapsulates my whistleblower disclosures uh, as well. So I'll, ju I'll just kind of fire these off because I think they're interesting. And in a seven month tenure, it's, it's a lot <laughs> for someone to, um, <clears throat> uh, to get done. Uh, the Trump appointee fired the presidents of all of our networks uh, who had been selected by the agency's prior bipartisan board and replaced them with, with Trump loyalists. That was really kind of uh, you know, a first day kind of thing. Uh, the Trump appointee fired the boards of all of our grantee networks, uh, which prior uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the Trump appointee arriving had typically been, um, the board members had typically been people with communications experience, uh, uh, knowledge of diplomacy or regions around the world, uh, uh, accomplished executives in communications or media, former ambassadors. Uh, instead, he replaced the board uh, of our grantees uh, with himself, his chief of staff, uh, Trump appointees from other federal agencies and additional Trump loyalists, including someone who worked for an LGBT uh, hate group, uh, which stood out to me, I'm gay. And, and that in particular was uh, of concern. Um, he initiated investigations of reporters who he felt had been critical of uh, in their reporting, uh, such as one uh, reporter at VOA who wrote a story uh, about first lady Melania Trump 
uh, he initiated an investigation of a reporter who had covered the Biden campaign's appeal to Arab voters because it seemed to be too friendly to uh, the Biden campaign. Uh, he initiated an investigation of VOA's chief White House correspondent who had uh, uh, <clears throat> not in too much uh, earlier revealed that Vice President Mike Pence refused to wear a face mask while touring the Mayo Clinic during the height of the pandemic. Um, uh, the Trump appointee improperly removed VOA's head of editorial standards. Uh, he illegally moved millions of dollars without congressional notice and funneled money to an organization with strong ties to Donald Trump. Uh, he intentionally created cash flow crises at our broadcast networks by refusing to distribute money on a timely basis, even to pay for such regular expenses as, as uh, rent and payroll. Um, you know, this is a, a lot of my day to day was trying to keep these networks operating uh, when uh, you know, they couldn't meet their, you know, kind of basic needs. Uh, he refused to extend visas for VOA staff that had been recruited from other countries because of their specialized language skills, uh, forcing some to return to hostile environments in home countries where they, they had been doing the tough job of, of, uh, of, uh, of reporting, you know, the critical work of journalism, a job that doesn't, you know, often make you friends with corrupt governments. Uh, for me personally, he revoked my security clearance as well as those of the entire senior management staff so that we couldn't work. Uh, he then proceeded to spend nearly $2 million of taxpayer money on an outside law firm to investigate me and the other members of the management team. Uh, they confiscated my phone, my laptop, turned it over to a technology firm uh, to scrape all the data they could find on it. And then they assembled a team with upwards of um, dozens, maybe upwards of 60 people to go through tens of thousands of my emails uh, going back years looking for some reason to fire me. Um, uh, they accused me of helping fill the agency with spies. Uh, you know, this is you know, part of the conspiracy mentality uh, of these people, um, you know, just uh, basically accusing me of betraying my country, of being a traitor, a heinous lie and a, a baseless accusation. Uh, they would never say that to my face because they're cowards and these sort of people uh, often are. Uh, in the end, the Inspector General's office from the State Department, which uh, uh, it, uh, Inspector Generals are offices in, in most federal government agencies uh, that have been established by Congress to look for fraud, waste and abuse, uh, to do audits, investigations. Um, they reviewed the charges against me and others and found that they were baseless and motivated by retaliation. Uh, but those seven months were a long and difficult road, and frankly, there's still a lot of unfinished and unresolved work. Uh, I had the able assistance of many attorneys, uh, including the Government Accountability Project, who's helping with the event today. Uh, they and others, uh, including congressional staff on both sides of the aisle, uh, you know, serious uh, Republican and Democratic staff members um, and, and members of Congress, uh, you know, who, who care about professional journalism. Uh, were concerned about what was happening, and they were also very supportive. Um, ultimately, I served as the named plaintiff in a lawsuit that resulted in a federal court issuing an injunction that prevented the Trump nominee from interfering with the newsrooms of our networks. Uh, that was uh, key to protecting the journalism at VOA uh, and our other networks. Uh, from my vantage point today, I, I think of it as a, uh, as a success, but I think that success is largely because the tenure of this dysfunctional leadership group was so short. Uh, they only had seven months. Uh, you know, the, the Senate, you know, didn't confirm uh, uh, Michael Pack until June um, of 2020 uh, in the election year. Uh, so they couldn't really carry out their plans. Uh, if Donald Trump had won the 2020 presidential election, I'm very certain I'd be out of a job today and, and pretty powerless to do anything about it, uh, despite you know, all of the, you know, able assistance I've received. Um, you know, as, as maybe uh, to kind of conclude my, my remarks, uh, a couple of observations. Uh, you know, the Trump team that took over my agency was motivated by a brand of, of extreme partisan politics. Um, uh, you know, something that I think we see on the rise in, in, in a lot of Western democracies, unfortunately. Uh, they were afflicted from what I could tell by notable paranoia, a conspiracy theory mentality, a belief that all federal employees were working against them. Uh, they had little respect for law or regulation or policy, no fundamental respect for the truth that I witnessed. And, and you know, this is kind of the heart of, of, of propagandists. Um, they were also motivated by deep loyalty to Donald Trump personally and his brand of politics and policies. 
uh, regardless of what they were, it seemed, and, and how they, they, you know, they might vacillate uh, day to day. Uh, of course, you know, one calling card of the Trump presidency was the phrase fake news. And I think my agency was certainly painted with that label uh, by the former president. Uh, I think to the people who he sent to our agency, this organization was the embodiment of that, of that fake news phrase in their minds, uh, and therefore something to, to rage against. Um, uh, so that's how I be, uh, became a whistleblower, uh, out of necessity, out of shock, uh, out of the need to try and protect myself and to protect a mission I believed in, uh, a mission I believe is incredibly important to uh, decision making in the world. Uh, you know, the, the practice of, of professional journalism is, is, is so central. Uh, without high quality journalism, we might find ourselves without the information we need to make decisions as a global community. Uh, you know, in China at the start of the pandemic, VOA and, and Radio Free Asia's ratings shot through the roof. Uh, you know, our, our audience numbers were up by hundreds of percent uh, because people in China, particularly Wuhan, wanted to find out what was happening. You know, official Chinese state media certainly wasn't telling them. Uh, nothing was happening, according to Chinese domestic media. Uh, and the Chinese reflexively, I think, uh, just tried to hide it for weeks. But that false narrative didn't match the world that uh, the world that people saw in front of them, it, it didn't match what was happening on the streets, uh, certainly not for the people in, in Wuhan. Um, you know, and, and imagine trying to judge what's happening now in Ukraine based on uh, only what Vladimir Putin says or what's reported on the Russia Today network. Uh, without real journalists to provide critical information, people are left to wonder and guess about the truth, uh, the facts on the ground. Uh, and I think the same can be said for whistleblowers. Uh, you know, we fill that function as, as well. We shine the light that's bringing clarity uh, and accountability. Um, anyway, I greatly appreciate once again that all of you are thinking about these issues and, and hopefully sharing my story paints a picture of some of the challenges. Um, I'll end my remarks there because I know there are a variety of, of questions that this session is trying to explore. Uh, I think my situation was an unusual confluence of politics, populism, media, and mayhem. <laughs> And I hope it was helpful in some way for you to, to, to hear about it. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, Grant. First, um, for actually your work as the whistleblower, um, but also for really outlining your case so clearly. Uh, and it really uh, is a great fit for this first session. It touches upon, um, we have a number of key topics we're hoping to cover. And both the sort of detailed look you did at sort of the attack on media as media and the, the actual steps, how do you attack the media? Um, sort of like, so it's a, it's a shopping list of how to do it. Um, but also your comments at the end about the, the absence of good news, or excuse me, the absence of good reporting and information uh, and what opportunities that provides uh, authoritarian governments is really a, also a great lead in for one of the things we wanna talk about today. Um, but before we do that, um, two things I just wanted to know, we've already got some questions coming in. So thank you all very much um, for really being so active right at the outset. We encourage them to keep coming. Um, and I also just wanted to give the panelists before again, we dive into sort of our um, plan for this first session, any initial comments or reactions um, on Grant's case that you might wanna share? If I can just, if I can jump in quickly to start things off after that uh, brilliant presentation. And I think Grant's outline actually already gives us a very good idea of how this information, especially when it's um, spread to the point where it has an actual impact on public opinion and, and, and policy making, uh, the, the effects that has on whistleblowers and their uh, motivation to come out with sensitive information, uh, it, it, um, it discourages them on so many levels, and it can also discourage the servants who are meant to investigate or act on that information from acting on it, from uh, doing their uh, job in a fair manner. Uh, for example, all the accusations uh, and all the false foods that were spread about brands uh, those are personal attacks that definitely have an effect on uh, on people's motivation to do to 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 uh, release the information. And when also other whistleblowers see that, they're most definitely discouraged as well. So there is this cyclical malign effect that we are seeing most definitely. Yeah. 
Mary, did you want to speak? I saw you are muted. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was really interesting, Grant. What I'd like to know really is what changed for you. I mean, you've given a very good comprehensive account of just the sheer volume of attacks against you and your uh, uh, department. Um, so, so what changed? How are you still standing? You know, I, I, you know, coming out, I, I think I, I, I finally had a, a little sliver of what PTSD, you know, feels like, you know, because it was a pretty tumultuous seven months. And then we had our sort of January 6th in, insurrection and our contested uh, uh, election. Um, you know, our, the journalists in, in our uh, organization, um, I, I held up really well to this. I mean, you know, they they continue to do their jobs and resist the, the intrusions. So, um I, I, you know, it feels like it's, it was many years ago, you know, it's odd, you know, we had, a, we sort of recognized recently kind of the, you know, the first year of, you know, there was a lot of stuff around the January 6 uh, events at, at the U.S. Capitol and then, and then uh, the, the first year that uh, of, of Biden's president just, presidency just passing. And it struck me that, gosh, it, it doesn't, it's both been very, very fast the past year, but that era that I lived through just seems so ancient to me in a, in a weird way. Um, so the agency in some respects feels, feels a kind of back, back to normal, but I kind of, uh, you know, find myself sitting up at night thinking about 2024 and thinking about, um, you know, kind of the polarized politics that, that we have and, and where that, you know, that leads, it just feels very dangerous and things like Ukraine just make the whole world feel, you know, like it's shifting under our feet. So, I'm, and it's probably not much of an answer. Samantha, I saw you had. Hi, yes, I just wanted to, to chime in. And first of all, Grant, thank you so much for, for being here and sharing your, your story with us today. I think it's a really, really important one and a great way to start this off. We're going to be talking soon about, I know, authoritarian regimes and the differences with democracy. I think that, you know, Grant's experience is um, a familiar one uh, for some of the whistleblowers who are with us today. Um, and many whistleblowers were joining us. I think we'll see common trends for what they experienced and, you know, the psychological warfare that that Grant went through, you know, was was at the hands of the of a democratic government. And I think that, you know, we are uh, as susceptible in democracies um, as these sorts of attacks could occur in authoritarian regimes. We are as susceptible as government employees as we are as corporate employees. The experience of a cor corporate whistleblower um, and a government whistleblower, um, you'll see a lot of the same you know, behaviors in terms of retaliation. Um, and the terms of the balance of power and everything that has to be done to support a whistleblower in a situation like that, um, uh, you know, is, is so extreme in order to, to reverse the, the balance of, of power and really restore justice. And we're really seeing that play out in um, recent history. We're seeing it play out during the pandemic. And we're seeing how this has a chilling effect on people who are considering whether or not to say something. And so we are in the biggest whistleblowing crisis in the world. And I think we have to see that crisis as much as we see that we're in a disinformation crisis. You need whistleblowers like Grant um, to stick their necks out and they shouldn't have to put so much on the line in order to speak truth to power. So thank you, Grant. Thank I you. just want to, to jump in uh, to say, Grant, you are a more a role model to others as other whistleblowers who will speak today. I live in Amman, Jordan, so I represent, you know, somebody from the Middle East and North Africa, where we think that there is a triangle of investigative journalists, fact checkers and whistleblowers that need to collaborate together, especially that some governments here in the region are part of the players of the misinformation, disinformation. They are the one who disseminate misinformation, disinformation and retaliate really strongly and harshly against all the three 
the investigative journalists, the fact checkers, and the whistleblowers. We have just launched, you know, pre-Christmas, and dear Mary Ann Manuel was with us, the first Arabic language whistleblower platform that uh, whistleblowers can have a safe, secure way to get the information in this region, which is much needed with no access to information. And the issue that it's um, very sad that the shrinking of the media freedom of expression uh, in the last uh, two, three years, especially with the pandemic, and we'll talk about this later in our, in our recession, uh, really uh, had a big effect on us. So I think we in this region need more to know about the cases of strong, courageous whistleblowers and learn from that and get our journalists, fact checkers and whistleblowers to learn about this more and in Arabic language because many of them, they don't speak English and they don't know about what's happening in other parts of the world. Thank you. Rowan, I was going to uh, add academics and turn your triangle into a square, um, but, but a really, really great point. Um, I thought before we sort of dive in a little bit more, uh, I would pose um, sort of kind of combine two of the first questions we had that sort of um, might be viewed as kind of preliminary. And I think one way of getting at the questions are sort of um, how do we define or know we have misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, sort of who gets to decide? How do we know we have that? And a, and a related version sort of how do you know something is a conspiracy sort of, you know, if you sort of uh, have that conversation going out there. If maybe one or two of you just kind of want to offer a few thoughts on that before we continue on, that would be great. Uh, well, I could uh, start with some preliminary thoughts about how journalists uh, approach these questions. Um, and uh, it's, very difficult as something is emerging to figure out whether something is uh, real or not real or um, a piece of uh, erroneous information or whether it's purposefully uh, being peddled as uh, a lie or a piece of misinformation. And then secondarily, of course, it's very difficult to figure out whether something is a conspiracy theory, which I would define as um, a kind of murky uh, uh, discussion or idea that uh, of some unseen force that is uh, ca causing something to happen. I'm just sort of making that up off the top of my head. Um, and a journalist's obligation is to sift through these uh, things through adequate sourcing. Um, and that sourcing means that you have to question the sources that are coming to you and telling you things. Um, and that's, you know, you have to question those uh, sources when they're certainly when they're in power um, and they have authority. Um, but also you have to be skeptical about whistleblowers um, uh, and interrogate those uh, those kinds of uh, um, sources as well. Um, you do that in a slightly different way. So, um, I do that in a in a gentler and uh, more sympathetic way. Um, but you constantly have to both believe in your story and your sources and doubt your story and your sources and um, and move to the truth. Um, and then once you have figured out that you think what you think is true, you have to report it in a way that makes it clear what uh, the point of the story is so that you're not giving equal weight to both sides in a kind of mindless way. Now, many stories are complex and have more than two sides um, and you have to sift through that and write for a lay audience um, and write something that is true. Uh, you know, the classic example is climate change, which I don't, don't cover, but um, where, you know, something like 98, 99, over 99% of scientists agree that there's man-made climate change. And 
So for a very long time, journalists were overweighting the views of people who are skeptical of climate change because they wanted to have a kind of uh, sense that there was uh, multiple sides of this. Uh, and that was actually misleading to the public. And so what we, our job is to sift through the expert opinion and distill it and come up with what we think is true. And then uh, sometimes we get it wrong. Um, and sometimes we've overweighted certain opinions um, or uh, you know, in the COVID coverage, again, something that I haven't directly covered, um, you know, there may have been overweighting of certain scientific uh, opinions because, you know, because it was a scientific question, but then there were questions of policy uh, and politics that needed to come to the fore, and they've come to the fore later. And so what you need to do as a journalist is correct and be humble um, about your knowledge and understand how little we do know and try to convey what you do know and how you know it um, in a clear way while protecting sources. Uh, and also convey what you don't know and what isn't clear. And by doing that, you're sifting through complex realities and trying to provide people with real information and things that are not misinformation or conspiracies. Thank you. Um, Samantha, you wanna add just one thing in and then we'll sort of dive into some of our other questions. Yeah, super fast. You know, I just wanted to point out, it's okay to be wrong. Um, the, the gold standard for whistleblowers is that they have a reasonable belief that the information, the evidence that they provided evidence is some sort of wrongdoing. And it, it's okay after an investigation that they be proven wrong, um, as long as they reasonably believe it's true. Misinformation is really, you know, false or inaccurate information that someone shares without that intention to deceive. It can be dangerous. I think we've seen that. Um, disinformation is really defined um, as, you know, someone with an intent to mislead or harm or manipulate. Um, and that is really, um, I think, what uh, we're, we're really grappling with um, today the most is that sort of intentionality and fraud is sort of closely related and that there's some sort of profit motive uh, behind that intent to deceive and, and manipulate. So we're all kind of talking about this dis disinformation, but you know there is sort of a line there. I mean, it's okay to be wrong, um, but we're looking at that intentionality. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so for this for, for first session, there were sort of four um, sort of big themes, topics I was hoping we can kind of um, touch upon. And the first one is one that actually, Grant, you started with right in the, the um, tail end of your case study, uh, which was sort of thinking about um, disinformation and authoritarian regimes. And you often hear a couple of different kind of things. So sometimes you hear saying, uh, well, if it's an authoritarian regime, they're actually more resilient um, to disinformation than democracies. They can do a better job against it. Um, and so I just kind of want to put that out there and just sort of get your thoughts on sort of what, how you see disinformation playing different kinds of roles within authoritarian regimes. Um, so just open it up for anyone's. Yeah, I think, you know, that it, it's uh, the authoritarian regimes have changed their tactics after the pandemic situation. So many of what we are witnessing today was in the drawer with clear plans, but ready to be implemented. And then when every country closed its borders and became, the pandemic became a security issue rather than a medical pandemic issue, they used those uh, ready-made uh, menus to go into implementing um, a lot on the um, censorship, on surveillance, on misinformation, disinformation. And it was the perfect timing, the golden perfect timing to do everything they wanted to do from before. For example, I'll give a quick example. In Jordan, we had access to information law. We apply to different ministries, municipalities, and so we applied 20 times in 2020. We got replies only twice. 
So only two times out of 20 times we applied. So if I, in my analysis, things did not go better now with the more, you know, um, removing of the medical pandemic situation with more vaccine, you know, going around uh, the, the surveillance, the laws, the security laws are still used the same and the misinformation, malinformation, disinformation is still on, on, on the rise, especially in Arabic language, for example, where AI is very um, uh, back from English language because of different accents, you need a lot of manual work rather than AI to find out many things. Goran? The way, the way I think about this information, and, and this is definitely relevant to understanding how it works and differs in authoritarian states is that information and disinformation very much is well it's basically one element of, of knowledge that's the way i think about it disinformation as knowledge and by knowledge i mean uh, basically the, the 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 stories that we tell ourselves as a society and as individuals the stories that underpin or, or form the basis of uh of society it's it's this knowledge paradigm that that surrounds all of us and authoritarian states, they, they can centralize knowledge production and, and the spread of knowledge and access to knowledge. And this is what, and of course, uh, that knowledge is framed in, in an overarching uh, framework of disinformation. And this, this essentially lets uh, authoritarian states and their leaders to justify all manner of policies, external or internal, because they can uh, create the narratives that they need, uh, they can create the pretexts uh, that they need for them to act on their ambitions. Um, in a very real sense, they can invent their own reality as they go. And, and what really allows them to do this is the over, uh, it's the underlying authoritarian system of it all that allows them to centralize the, the production and the spread of information, uh, which is why, of course, media freedom and media in general play such a crucial role in, in democratic societies because they equip citizens with the with the the knowledge and information that they actually need to act and decide in their own best interest it, and this is a, i think this is a crucial way of looking at it this information as as uh, affecting the knowledge paradigm of societies in general Samantha? <laughs> you, you almost, you call on me before I even, you, you knew I was gonna wanna talk and it's true, I did. Um, you know, I just wanted to share that I think, you know, during the pandemic, we really saw that there were nations that had nationwide gag orders like Bangladesh and Thailand that said the government would take action against people who spread, you know, rumors um, about COVID-19. It was kind of a way of gripping control. Um, in Honduras, um, the president issued um, an emergency decree restricting freedom of expression, um, movement, and assembly. You're really seeing that extreme form of control. That was later lifted. Um, but if you look at the case of uh, Bangladesh, there were several journalists who were criticized, um, who were criticizing the government about their response to COVID-19, and they were ended up being charged under the Digital Security Act. Um, and there were people who were charged for being connected to a Facebook group that criticized um, the government's response to COVID-19. Um, Malaysia, um, this is another country where um, someone posted a warning on Facebook about a cruise ship that was carrying a thousand passengers from Penang, China, that was arriving in Kuala Lumpur. And she accused the government of not having proper COVID-19 screening in place. Um, and she was arrested and she was charged with inciting public fear and was facing up to six years in prison. Um, so I think we have to be honest when we're looking, you know, when you see governments, issuing gag orders and weaponizing that, weaponizing the rule of law against whistleblowers and against journalists, um, that level of um, state control, um, to be honest, is something you also see in democracies. 
Um, but um, I think we have to take a look at these patterns. And usually when there's someone with something to hide, this is the sort of behavior that you see. I don't think it's necessarily unique to authoritarian um, regimes. Um, I think it's sort of equally bad everywhere from my observations of tracking um, COVID whistleblowing um, since the beginning of the pandemic around the world. Well, sort of taking that, um, you know, sort of looking a little bit beyond authoritarian, I kind of would like to turn um, our attention to um, populism, right? misinformation, malinformation, and populism, uh, which um, certainly Samantha, as you suggest, is, that's, can be seen in many, many countries. Um, and then the real question, I guess, to think about is what is the relationship? Um, you know, so, you know, um, it, you know, there's been a suggestion, um, research uh, and analysis looking at, um, you know, populist efforts to divide, you know, people into sort of the good people and the corrupt elites, um, which sort of tends to move towards sort of an anti-expert, anti-evidence, um, evidence-free, um, kinds of approaches to information. And um, just sort of two quick examples, just to kind of get us thinking a little bit about it. Um, the founder of the Italian Five Star Movement, um, Beppe Grillo, uh, was spreading fears about vaccines causing autism. And, and this was actually measles vaccine, right? Um, and Italy uh, had 26.5% of the cases of measles in Europe, so really quite serious. Um, but kind of very much both the populist and kind of the misinformation. Uh, and then the US offers many of its own examples uh, during Barack Obama's uh, run for office, uh, Donald Trump and others were part of the birther movement, right? Making sort of uh, claims about the false um, or um, improper birth certificate information uh, for President Obama. And again, uh, sort of really trying to make that a, a, a media sensation. Um, so I just kind of wanted to open it up for you all to think, you know, thoughts you have on sort of populism and where that fits in. It's not really a specific kind of government, but really a, something we're seeing in many, many countries. And so um, any thoughts you want to offer? I'll offer something, Diane, that I think is uh, an interesting kind of twist on, on things. Um, over the last several years across a lot of um, our, our media platforms, we've seen tremendous growth. And it's, um, I think, very much linked to uh, just the internet and uh, the spread of digital and, and social media. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges, you know, we face is that um, it's so easy to have uh, uh, a broadcasting platform now. You know, historically, you know, things were a bit simpler. You know, we had newspapers and people would get their news from, you know, from a newspaper. And then uh, in America, you know, for many decades, we had three large television networks and everyone, you know, heard the news through these kind of old school, you know, journalists, you know, who didn't even want to, you know, show any emotion, you know, on, you know, on camera. Uh, you know, now anyone can, you know, uh, you know, use their iPhone, you know, set up a, a YouTube channel and, you know, start drawing a lot of views and they don't necessarily have to tell the truth. I mean, it, they, they might even be well-intentioned, uh, but still sharing uh, misinformation or disinformation or, you know, kind of perpetuating uh, lies that are, you know, that are hard to, uh, to refute. Um, you know, so on, on the micro scale, you have that. And then on this macro scale, you have, you know, large state actors like, uh, Russia or China, who have very well-funded uh, uh, um, media operations worldwide, uh, and, and it's very sophisticated, and and uh, uh, it's much easier to to tell, I think, an interesting lie to do than to do the hard uh, journalistic uh, work that um, you know that Jesse talked about earlier, for instance. Um, so I, I thought I'd kind of just share that perspective that it's it's been sort of a two-sided you know, blade for us. We've benefited from our audience expanding, but we've also seen the, uh, the, the multiplicity of, of disinformation and, and uh, uh, sources of, uh, of propaganda also multiply. If I can just jump in and, and, and 
absolutely agree that there is this uh, direct connection really between populism and disinformation uh, and weak leadership, weak political leadership, I would say. Uh, populism is often a sign of weak political leadership, uh, meaning that uh, politicians are, 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 are tend to act according to public opinion. They tend to take the easy road of uh, polarizing and dividing society for political advantage, basically. And one that, what ends up happening is, is that the more ubiquitous this information is in that society, the more those same politicians are forced to act according to the disinformation narratives because all of a sudden they've become the dominant worldview of society and uh, well, their job as populist is to act on it because they rely on that to uh, gain power or stay in power. And, and so really there is this, <laughs> this very strong connection that you can see in, in studies estimating the effects of disinformation uh, it's 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 very obvious sometimes. Yeah, and if I if I could add to that, um, I think uh, you know, looking at the methodology methodologies used to perpetuate and spread various types of information, whether it be misinformation, disinformation, or just some other type of of uh, information, is um, you know there are methodologies that are commonly used in political campaigns around the world, not only in the United States. So you might see that, for example, um, geo-targeting of targeted ads is used in the United States, and it's also used in uh, countries in Latin America and across the Middle East and beyond. And, um, you know, or for example, psychometric profiling. And I know that in some countries, they're starting to kind of lock it down or try to lock it down on a social media level, but that's not the case everywhere. And so I think it's really um, quite tricky because, I mean, both in the sense of people who are participating in, in democracies and politics and voting, um, what information are they receiving? But I think also uh, for people who are looking to verify information, it can be really tricky when, you know, it may be that you are receiving a certain set of, um, you know, search results and the person down the street is receiving a different set of search results. And that can make it really difficult then as well to kind of have a consensus of like, what is, you know, the truth or what is the, the verified, verifiable facts as well. And if I may build on Safa's great comments here and, um, what I think there's a really great example of two whistleblowers and it's really the Cambridge Analytica scandal that really highlighted this, right? So this is the example of Brittany Kaiser and Christopher Wiley um, exposing the fact that both the Trump campaigns and the Brexit campaigns were using um, Cambridge Analytica to prey upon the populist non-nativism you know, sentiments, the anti-immigrant sentiments, um, and look at psychological profiling and send the disinformation specifically to the people that they knew from psychological profile from their Facebook um, data were most susceptible. Um, so I, I think that's a really interesting place where all of these come together, the whistleblower's role, um, exposing how these campaigns were using very sophisticated techniques that Safa just described. Mary McGuire, did you just have something you wanted to add? Yes, uh, yes, actually, thank you. I was going to pick up on, on Mary's point as well about this, uh, you know, bad actors have been very successful at um, denigrating the need for verification. Um, you know, it's almost seen to be um, a, a kind of a conspiracy in itself. You know, seeking verification from reliable sources is in itself now considered to be, you know, anti-democracy. Um, you know, they're keeping lies from us and they're trying to wrap it all up. And I and I, I do worry about the levels of scepticism, particularly amongst younger voters. You know, uh, around the main what we call the mainstream media, and uh, I certainly think that Trump has been very effective at, um, at undermining the mainstream media in that respect. But it's it's, it's well established that the UK government are doing a good job as well. 
I love that point, Mary, in terms of, um, and this is from one Mary to another. Um, I love the, the very anti-expert sentiment that we saw in Brexit, which was, you know, so that doesn't even allow you to take the information, right? It's just, we're going to disregard anything that comes from an expert because experts are, you know, part of the elite and they're feeding you um, their own agenda. So you're not able to take that information in. Great. Um, this is just so interesting. Uh, <laughs> I am, I have so, and I want to keep this going, but I also want to make sure we are able to sort of weave in a couple of other really important themes on this first topic. Um, we have about 15 plus minutes left. I'm going to eke a little more into that. This is so interesting. Um, and the two things I want to talk about are sort of political actors and then, you know, sort of government media and dis disinformation. I want to let, save a lot of time for media. So I just kind of want to combine the kind of question or about political actors in the following way. And it's really just think about what kinds of you know, duties or roles um, should we be thinking of sort of political actors having with respect to information? You can think about it, for example, in the election context. Um, you know, can you make genuinely false promises and statements um, just to get elected? Uh, so, you know, um, there's sort of examples related to shrinkflation. You make promises about sort of what you're going to do with budgets, with services, with taxes, knowing none of that's true, none of that's possible, and you don't do it anyway, of course. Um, another can be, you know, sort of spreading misinformation um, in the context of other kinds of elections. So we saw a lot of this being raised uh, with Brexit um, and false facts. Uh, you know, being a major sort of part of the story. And a number of you have said, you know, once it starts to get woven in, it, it becomes hard to even pull that back out. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to, um, you know, raise that kind of question, sort of the responsibility of sort of politicians uh, and political actors in terms of sort of information in these, you know, these parts of the democratic environment. I'll jump in just really quickly with um, something that I think it is effective. And I just wonder, and I know this is getting to solutions or looking at solutions at the very end, but one of the only places where you start to see um, real time fact checking, because I think that's what's needed here is in the debates. Um, and because as we were just saying, if you don't, if it gets out there, then it takes on a life of its own. And I would just love to see when I mean, we're starting to see it and you, you even see some of the moderators It really needs to start with the moderators in the debates, just not asking, you know, or calling them out in the moment. Um, and I think that, and when we, you know, there's a lot of, at least as to the American presidential debates, there are a lot of criticisms of the moderators. So I think, um, that is a phenomenon of how do we get the fact checking out there in time for it to actually have an impact is really important and that that politicians use that to their advantage to let it get out there and then it becomes a story and because no one wants to fact check or it's already out ahead of itself so is there something we can do to catch it before it catches steam Robert? Well, one thing always stands out is a, a major whistleblower group in the United States. In 2008, which was a big presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, and uh, they sent out a questionnaire to all of the, uh, all of the candidates in 2008. And I remember reading uh, Barack Obama's response. And essentially, he checked all the boxes of how much of a whistleblower advocate he is, and that he, he was a, uh, he even said in the campaign trail that he was a whistleblower attorney, a constitutional attorney. And he, in that form, and it was submitted, it was, it's still posted online, that he was going to be the biggest advocate for whistleblowers and uh i've blown the whistle now on the the second bush administration the obama administration the trump administration the biden administration and uh frankly president obama was by far the worst of all of them so uh i mean he campaigned on this and i never forgot this 
uh, other presidents just, they don't even want to touch it. But uh, President Obama braced it and later on did the polar opposite. And in my ordeal, I would say the Obama appointees literally tortured me after, uh, after they lost to uh, my Supreme Court case. So this is not just a liberal, conservative, this is the entire spectrum. And uh, I think the biggest problem, we just don't hold our politicians, politicians accountable later. And I re, uh, to finish this off, John Stewart uh, made it a big issue on his program how President Obama went against all of his promises on government transparency and protecting whistleblowers. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And again, I think that kind of goes back to something, Samantha, you had said about sort of the broad reach of the kinds of problems that we're looking at today. Um, Donato, did you have something you wanted to bring in here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting uh, question and discussion about the role of political actors uh, and this information during the elections. Um, as mentioned by Professor Ring, uh, we have a more than uh, an evidence now of a politician who announced the radical actions before the elections, and they are uh, unable to deliver uh, on their promises. Let me do another example now, because we have a Brexit, but we have uh, other things like uh, many politicians promise uh, generally less taxes and more services before any election, and then apply more taxes and ensure less services due to high tax and uh, uh, expenditure. These are all a basic scenario, but uh, we all know the relevant topics around uh, um, this, uh, this point. Uh, currently, uh, and this is uh, uh, the main aspect that I would like to talk with you, um, is to discuss the, if we can adopt binding mandate as a mechanism to counter um, this point. And the use of a binding mandate uh, for preventing false, no real populist promises on the part of politicians in the area of election during the election is a very complex issue. So we need to pay attention to this point and also to uh, the adoption of, of a similar mechanism. Um, in other words, uh, the politicians, after that they uh, have tried to uh, promise the world, uh, they have to follow their promise based on this rule. Um, we need to know that in many states, bending or imperative mandates for politicians are excluded to ensure also that they are not in service certain powers uh, or that there are the conflicts of interest or cases of corruption or that they represent just uh, an interest and um, at the same time it should be uh, guaranteed that the parliamentarian represents all the people so even if we discuss then there is this attempt i think uh, that this kind of solution at the moment is complicated also considerable critical aspect at the same time there are uh, other kind of solution uh, in law like the par condition law, uh, this is for example in Italy, uh, that try to guarantee equal treatment to political parties during the election, but really it does not impact on the content of the promises. So uh, talking about this, I think that we could introduce many, many legal mechanisms to restrict the freedom of expression of uh, politicians or uh, uh, impose to follow what is established in a crazy mandate or a contract between the people and, uh, and politicians. I remember you that someone uh, signing the contract in a country with people with some uh, promises that were real, uh, similar to fake. And this was a, a real case. Uh, however, uh, I think that uh, it could be dangerous to apply similar mechanisms. And uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, real solutions are uh, in other instruments, different from law. And sometimes uh, uh, I talk from a university perspective, people need to be educated about the information. So I don't just uh, uh, disappoint because we need, of course, to work at the low level, but there is something that we need to do in terms of education uh, about this information, malinformation. And also anyone in the future will be able more to understand if uh, the promises on uh, less tax law are really based uh, on that or not. So this is the challenge for the future, uh, also for the election. 
Yes, indeed, the challenge for the future. Um, I want to turn now, and we've um, talked a little bit about media already, um, but it's so central um, and, and really Grant's case uh, highlights when you sort of walk through the bullet points of what was done, highlights exactly how um, media can um, be attacked and how it can be susceptible um, to control. Um, and so I wanted to, to really turn our attention to government media and disinformation, but kind of break it out a little bit into a couple of different kinds of concerns we might have. Um, and the first is sort of the, the potential for lack of independence of media and the resulting disinformation where governments are controlling, um, censoring, um, and uh, you know, maybe even owning or you know, sort of um, consolidating ownership of the media. Um, we've seen some examples of that kind of consolidation uh, in Hungary. And so I just first on that one, see if anyone had any sort of observations or thoughts on um, you know, sort of the, the concerns about lack of independence. Uh, if I can just begin by uh, making a reference to, uh, to, to Eastern Europe and Central Europe, where the problem with media is, is very much tangible and extremely pertinent, because especially after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, that led to uh, a very detrimental effect to media freedom um, in, in countries in Eastern and Central Europe. The outlets all of a sudden didn't have the finances to uh, subscribe to reputable news agencies. So there were all sorts of issues with content provision. Uh, they were much more dependent on government grants and financing uh, to continue doing their work. And over the, ten, the past uh, 10 and more years, we've uh, absolutely seen how uh, this retreat of uh, Western media companies and uh, and, and, and really a free fall in the, media, in the media landscapes of a lot of these countries, how that is uh, definitely one of the biggest vulnerabilities to these countries, both in terms of internal uh, corruption and undue influence and in terms of outside malign influence. Uh, it's definitely one of those regions where uh, it, it's basically symptomatic. It's, uh, it's a great example of why media freedom is so important. What happens when you take it away? Samantha? I just kind of wanted to add to that because I think that the funding issue is a really serious one. Um, you know, the media, it's, it's absolutely imperative that it is independent from government control. It's just too susceptible to, to abuse um, of, of power. And I think that, you know, what Kevin is going to be talking about, I think later today is on the opposite end, when you have these sort of pay to play um, media groups who will take money to push out a story is where you're getting a lot of um, disinformation and propaganda. And that can be just, you know, kind of a platform for spewing hatred and ruining people's reputations. And the thing about the media is once it's kind of out there, you know, it lives on forever. And um, it's a really, really powerful um, weapon. And, um, you know, that is something that it needs to be reckoned with because um, I don't think that you can have um, address this issue without dealing with the, the funding uh, problem that is perpetuating these uh, issues with misinformation and, and control. I'm gonna go to Robert and then Grant. Uh, I have three things. The first one is uh, I have a question. I'm just naive about this, but does, uh, does Russia uh, censor internet uh, platforms uh, for the for their people. Okay, Gorgon, you say yes. Gorgon, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, now everybody knows about RT.com, right? Well, RT.com literally blows my phone up every few months, asking for interviews. Ever since uh, my uh, Supreme Court victory, um, and I and I've seen often. Uh, well-known U.S. other than Edward Snowden, but they they like to have on their show uh, American whistleblowers. 
Um, and I don't know if people know, but they're a, uh, they're a Russian state um, propaganda agency. Um, third, third thing is, uh, sorry, I may be <laughs> a little harsh on people, but, you know, I grew up one of my first jobs was a was a uh, was delivering the newspaper in the 1970s. I mean, like that was like the only way people got their news, unless you had time to sit in front of the TV and watch the three networks. So and we had Watergate, we had Iran Contra. So I'm sorry if it. it I mean, unless your country is censoring the internet, there's really no excuse to to be duped by by quote unquote media outlets. I like to say is I use Twitter and I and I and I tailor it to journalists who I trust and I listen to podcasters who I trust. So um, people need to just stop turning on everything and uh, listening to all this background because it's very distracting. And those people are very talented and have ways to influence you into believing the disinformation. So uh, we're so lucky to have the internet. Thank you. All right, Grant and then Jesse. Yeah, I definitely echo that. You know, it's you know a terrific, you know, powerful tool. You know, for us is is you know reaching people via the internet. In a lot of markets that, that we operate, you know, we we do see the the impact of very strong actors or governments uh, in in the media world. Uh, in the Arab world, for instance, if you listen to certain networks, you will get the perspective of the government that basically you know, sits behind them. So, uh, you know, if you listen to Al Arabiya, you're going to hear kind of a Saudi perspective. If it's Sky News Arabia, it's going to be the Emiratis. If it's Al Jazeera, the, uh, the Qataris. Um, we have our Al Hora network, which is U.S. funded, uh, uh, editorially in, independent. And, uh, you, know, you know, we want it to be sort of a uni uniquely American perspective uh, on things. Uh, so certainly a lot of people are in a lot of markets trying to you know, play in, in the dis, in the discussions that are there. Uh, in Eastern Europe, we see the influence of a lot of um, oligarchs. We'll have uh, you know, kind of an oligarch-funded you know media uh, environment in certain countries, and you know, we'll have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, competitions be, uh, over you know trying to attract talent because they're throwing you know disproportionately large amounts of money at um, you know t you know on-air talent and, and journalists. Uh, you know, who are compelling uh, because it, it really, really suits them. Uh, and then, you know, in, in markets like Russia and China, when we try to reach into those markets, it's, uh, it's different uh, because uh, they have really rich media markets inside their own country. Uh, so, if, you know, if you're in China, uh, you might be able to go on the internet and, you know, use a VPN, you could access our Radio Free Asia or Voice of America, but you don't necessarily want to. I mean, there's, yeah, you know, there's there's so much there. Uh, there was a lot of discussion during, I think, during the recent Academy Awards, and and China was in, in a bit of the discussion too. That, um, you know, there are there are a lot of great movies coming out of Hollywood, but there are a lot of great movies coming out of China now for that market. So, you know, getting you know information into some of these really close, you know, somewhat close societies that are also um, wealthy and. Uh, interesting media environments is, is a challenge because people are hearing, you know, certain, uh, just, you know, kind of one side of a very complex story. Jesse and then Mary. Sure. I would just, uh, very quickly say that of course, uh, the free market is no panacea where, uh, you know, that, uh, state controlled media has, um, obvious downsides. Um, but we have very little state owned or state controlled media in this country. And we have, uh, you know, the, the biggest cable network in the country is a font of disinformation, uh, Fox News, uh, uh, and uh, a, a very dangerous outlet. Um, and, uh, and also we have a crisis 
um, in media because the economic model um, has collapsed over the last 20, 25 years or so. Um, so there's been sort of two simultaneous crises that have hit uh, the American media. One is a kind of decades long attack now, primarily from the right on the, uh, the notion that the journalism can be objective and uh, essentially an attack that mainstream journalism is liberal. There's also a left critique that it's kind of uh, centrist or center right. Um, and that has undermined the credibility of uh, mainstream journalism. Um, there's been some salutary effects of that. I think journalism has gotten better over time, but um, uh, because of some of these critiques, but it really has also undermined trust in the media. And then the second, as I alluded to, is the economic crisis where we've seen local newspapers dying um, and the collapse in advertising uh, and the rise of social media and Facebook um, in particular in Google to uh, steal the advertising from uh, advertising driven places and now high quality journalism is really available only on a subscription basis. And uh, while the New York Times has been extraordinarily successful and while the Washington Post is also high quality and pretty successful, these are very narrow um, niches that, uh, of people who really get high quality information. And the vast majority of Americans don't get high quality information and don't um, are not able to seek it out. And so we have a crisis um, there where uh, the truth just doesn't reach people. Thank you, Jesse. Um, Mary and then Safa and Samantha. Hello, yes, we've, we've also got in the UK, you know, the, uh, on one hand, you know, our kind of political leaders um, kind of publicly stating that they want to kind of root out corruption. Um, and on the, the other hand, sort of like enabling kind of Russian oligarchs to kind of filter money through London financial services through shell companies, you know, that really undermines the integrity of the finance market. Uh, so whether it's kind of um, foreign actors owning newspapers, you know, we've got the independent, we have uh, football stadiums, you know, it's, it's such a big thing. So a huge influence in sports, in housing, very close associations with political life. And this has a really corrupting effect. So I think we've got that on one hand, you know, the, the kind of power and influence that um, bad actors have at a government and political level. And then on the other hand, we have a government saying they want to um, kind of review the Human Rights Act uh, with a particular focus on freedom of expression and a particular focus on protecting journalists and journalist sources. Um, and at the same time, we have probably one of the centers where it's most easy for defamation claims to be brought in the London courts with relatively little, you know, by way of standing um, in order to silence individual journals, journalists, many of whom are freelance. So, you know, they don't have the power and weight of big organizations behind them. Um, you know, so they're being attacked at an individual level by the way in which other laws work. And, um, and at the same time, we have a government saying one thing and manifestly doing something different. And I would just add before Safa comes on, uh, Britain also has now privacy laws being used to that same effect. So just the way libel law had been uh, effectively used to um, squash the media, we've now just seen it was, um, I think uh, the Supreme Court ruled with the, the Bloomberg had invaded American businessmen's privacy uh, by reporting on uh, some investigations. And so really sort of an expansion of the legal tools um, that, that really sort of try to cabin reporting. Um, Safa, to you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I guess kind of connecting to the topic of privacy and, um, you know, and to risk sounding like a broken record, I keep coming back to this point of data and data collection because we really do see <clears throat> 
how much it is used. I mean, of course, the business model of the internet is data collection. And so that's exactly how information is tailored to us and content reaches us in this way. This is the same way that information, you know, we, we can so easily fall down rabbit holes. I know there are some researchers who have recorded in last years their sessions on, for example, signing up to Pinterest. And within just two clicks, uh, on, on a Pinterest uh, board, they were being fed curated conspiracy content, you know, or for example, anti-vax content. Um, and so, you know, of course, that's very problematic when we zoom out and we look at it in the context of people receiving information, people looking for news. Um, it still leads us to this question of even if someone is going out of their way to seek information sources, to seek reliable information, um, you know, we it, it, how, how difficult, how many obstacles or hurdles are in their way? And to maybe um, also just add one more thing onto that, um, my colleagues at Tactical Tech have uh, done a number of research projects, but one in particular rings uh, really true here. Um, it's called the influence industry. And uh, basically, it looks at how data is used in elections. Um, you know, in the same vein that we were talking earlier about methodologies of geo targeting and psychometric profiling, um, you know, just a few years ago, there were something like 300 companies who specialized in data, data brokerage, you know, who would buy, who buy and sell data. Um, but my colleagues just updated their research a few months ago and found that now there are 500 companies around the world who do this. So actually it's a growing industry and it's, I think it, it's, you know, on the one hand, I think that, yeah, it would be really great if everyone had access to digital literacy, digital and media literacy, to be able to look into that information. But we also know there are huge portions of the world population who are Facebook first users or WhatsApp first, where their only connection to the internet is through these platforms. And, and, you know, what does that say about how much onus should be on the individual versus these giant platforms? Um, you've all made such really important and interesting points on so many, I would say almost meta trends, whether it's in technology, um, in, in sort of um, the business ownership behind news. Uh, and, and I just wanted to, as we close out, go back to, uh, the some of the actually micro steps that sometimes we see governments doing to control media that that came out a little bit in grants and i just want to go off and just sort of list a few just from the us right uh uh so sort of the really kind of government actually attacking the media itself um as opposed to sort of creating environments where media really doesn't thrive in the way that we might be hoping for full information but restricting or trying to restrict press credentials based on the nature of your reporting and their views on it. Um, we've seen in the US, obviously under Trump, um, you know, dramatically inflammatory sweeping language against the media on a constant basis, which as some of you mentioned, when certain messaging becomes constant, uh, a never ending backdrop, it creates its own effect. Um, investigating and prosecuting media sources um, targeting media owners direct indirectly. So, you know, whether it's going after efforts to merge or their licenses or other side contracts that they have putting pressure on those who own media um, as a way to control. Um, and then just another example from the US um, reported harassment at the borders of media. Again, and Grant, you mentioned in a way, not necessarily at the borders, but that same kind of technique. And so um, it's really, I think, just useful to keep in mind the, the full scope of pressures um, from the, you know, the very global and, and sort of meta trends down to sort of really micro actions that the government can take. All right, this has been uh, absolutely thrilling session one. We went a little over time. It was worth every minute of it. Um, so we will now take a five minute break and resume um, at 1135 um, Eastern time. All right, see you shortly.